I just want to begin uh, my talk at the crossroads of the significance of this place and reflect on where I'm from, where the great waterways meet, the declaration and the origin of the Indigenous treaty rights within the colonial state of Canada, marking Winnipeg as Treaty 1 territory and the heartland of the Métis. I'm honored to be home and humbled by the generations of my family and the history of their strength and resilience. I want to highlight some of the key points uh, in my uh, career as both a curator, artist, and scholar. And I'm going to talk about some of my favorite examples, but by no means am I going to um, get to hit on all of the amazing and exciting curatorial and artistic projects uh, and Indigenous scholarship. For me, I was the first person in my extended family to attend a post-secondary degree. And so, as I stand here before you, I actually have three, almost four. Um, as an undergrad, a pivotal moment in my trajectory was witnessing Anishinaabe artist Robert Houle's solo exhibition, Sovereignty Over Subjectivity, in 1998 at the Winnipeg Art Gallery. I did not know it at the time, but this exhibition had put me on a path that I didn't actually know or see in my future. And I had never even imagined that for myself. I was the first time I had experienced Indigenous contemporary art, and I was inspired and moved by Robert Hold's work. To this day, I believe that art can radically shift mainstream or settler ideologies and create space for transformative social change. I've been a witness to this and embodied these practices. In my undergrad, I was offered a scholarship to attend the Iceland Academy and the University of Iceland. And, the, and for that year, uh, I was exposed to um, new ways of thinking about uh, contemporary work, but at the same time I exposed Icelandic culture to indigenous culture. Um, after completing my BA, I, my graduate work in Native Studies, I lived in northern Manitoba and Thompson for about six years and I traveled back and forth to do my undergrad and my graduate work. And that work was situated in an analyzing rural and remote Aboriginal women artists across Manitoba. This was a research project that was based with MAWA, Mentoring Artists for Women's Art. And I jumped in my car and put over 2,000 kilometers uh, visiting different places across the province. The outcome of the master's thesis argued that indigenous female artists such as Colleen Cutchell, Kathy Mattis, Margaret Dumas are social change agents. They are creating artwork that is rooted in their community and their embodied knowledge. I worked from principles of Grant Kester's concept of dialogical aesthetics and kind of moved away from the, the idea of the avant-garde object-based art. Uh, once finishing my thesis, I was accepted to York University in social and political thought and my dissertation addressed the concealed geographies of indigenous histories in the city of Toronto through selected artworks that addressed history, space and place, and narrated indigenous stories of place to visually demonstrate an alternative cartography that can challenge myths of settlement situated in colonial narratives of archeology span and geography. I utilize the Anishinaabe cosmos, the sky, earth, and the underground to engage with rewriting histories of space through indigenous artists. I use Jeff Thomas, whose image you see right there, as the sky world. He had done a series called Indians Go on Tour as um, aerial photographs of key historical spots within uh, Toronto. I looked at Rebecca Belmore's work, who you saw earlier to this slide, as the body in the middle world and Robert Hould's work, who was also on the previous slide as the underground, who looked at the um, rivers and hidden tributaries within the city and the ancient pathways of Young Street and the Humber River Valley that kind of connected uh, the north to the south of Lake Ontario. My research was grounded in concepts of native space and expanded upon the significance of embodied knowledge of indigenous people and highlighted the importance of reading the land as a valuable archive of memory and history. In 2008, not only did I get graced with the birth of my first child, I was also offered a tenure track position at OCAD University to help formate the first indigenous visual culture program, which I stayed there until uh, six, for six years, and then I accepted the new position as the chair here at the university and at the gallery. I moved to Manitoba for two reasons. Uh, first being that I'm confident that Winnipeg is at a pivotal moment where Indigenous artists could radically transform the city, and this is the central axis of my work. And the second, it is home. My family is here, my memories are here, and I'm excited to be here. 
I'm advocating for Winnipeg to be at the forefront of Indigenous contemporary arts. We need to break down barriers and support and contribute Indigenous art. We need to open up public spaces and begin this critical dialogue about what creative capital can do for the city of Winnipeg. We are currently experiencing a rejuvenation of the city's infrastructure and a new commitment and investment to creative spaces such as Urban Shaman, the Canadian Museum of Human Rights, Plug-in Gallery, the Winnipeg Arts Galleries, Inu Inuit Art Centre. Most recently, I've been working on discussing selected artworks in pursuit of, pursuit of Venus, which actually just came up, by Maori artist Lisa Rahana, who I curated in 2014 for Imaginative, and she also just represented New Zealand in the Venice Finale. I've also had the fortune of working and talking uh, about some of the multimedia installations of Bear Witness, Matt Eskimo, Jordan Bennett, Jackson Two Bears, and Beat Nation, and Cheryl LaRondell, Vancouver Songlines Project, which was the previous slide. I've also leaded a Kanata Indigenous Performance New Media Digital Art Project, which assembled a database on Indigenous performance and new media artists called Transactive Memory Keepers. This was done in a collaborative and collective methodology, which um, is our GLAM collective. <laughs> and for those of you that know Dr. Heather Gugliarte, who will be speaking later in the year, and also Dr. Carla Taunton, uh, we liked this uh, analogy. We called ourselves the GLAM collective, galleries, libraries, archives, and museums. We also like to uh, have red wine and dress up and uh, go to great places like Venice and Greece. Um, so uh, we just edited issue 54 of Public, um, art, Culture, and Ideas, which was called Indigenous Art, New Media, and the Digital. This showcased in Indigenous artists' strategies, scholarships, and practices in their innovative and dynamic political interventions, as well as contributions to the field of art history, visual culture, and media studies. The Winnipeg Art Gallery, as many of you know, uh, is on this quest to figure out what a new museum looks like, feels like, acts like, particularly in relation to centering Indigenous ideologies. The WAG is experimenting with new methods of museum practices that are rooted in Indigenous worldviews. This is a radical, I want to repeat, radical departure from its past and from museum and gallery processes more broadly. It, wa it wants to unpack its mechanics, its guiding principles, protocols, and values, dynamics, both interactions and relationships, and aesthetics, both visually and emotionally. The gallery wants to become a space that pushes boundaries of the 21st century museum. To date, there has been very few permanent positions of influence in organizational structure and curation for indigenous arts that are actually occupied by indigenous professionals. While there has been some movement for indigenous artists to contribute to the larger collections and exhibitions institutions across Canada, we have not made a concerted concerted effort to decolonize or shift their Eurocentric models, methodologies, or practices. Such practices are based on outdated, top-down model of avant-garde, object-based art that privileges a particular kind of art and artist, predominantly art that is created by and for an elite whale, white male public. Past museum and gallery displays have given little space for indigenous contemporary art, or have displayed these collections with very little input from Indigenous people, professionals, or community members. In Canada, over 25 years ago, Indigenous curator Leanne Martin created a list of recommendations to increase Indigenous participation in these areas. More recently, the Truth and Reconciliation Commission of Canada has issued 94 calls to action to address and rectify this pervasive influence of colonialism on Indigenous people. To date, Neither Martin or the TRC recommendations have been implemented on a broad scale. Museums and galleries need to shift from these outdated models and move into the new era of collaboration, engagement, and inclusion for all people across the globe. The principles of Indigenous methodologies are collaboration, learning by doing, consulting community experts, creative interventions, working with an intergenerational focus, uh, knowledge, mentorship, and listening to stories or voices of different stakeholders and community members. So for me, whether it's been co-curating, co-writing, artist collaborations, indigenizing institutions, developing new academic programs, or building new museums or galleries, sitting on advisory boards or research projects, the crux of my own professional success is the inherent value of working collectively. 
transpose this into the museum, collaboration builds capacity. And at the same time, it allows institutions to radically push back against the boundaries of Eurocentric masculine concepts of contemporary art, practices, and methodologies. At the way, I work directly with Indigenous curator and artist Jamie Isaac, who is now the curator of Indigenous and Contemporary Art. This was initially a Canada Council-funded residency, and now it is a permanent position. This is a huge win for us. It is one of the few permanent positions that are occupied by an Indigenous curator. Our work at the WAG addresses the historical gap in the institutional programming and engagement with Indigenous artists, curators, administrators, and audiences. As the WAG moves forward with the construction of the center, the tensions of building and focusing on Inuit art and culture in Winnipeg have become increasingly present. The Inuit Art Center will be built in the heart of Turtle Island. Winnipeg is home to one of the largest and fastest growing indigenous populations in Canada, and Inuit make up the smallest group of the people that call Manitoba home. It is important to understand that there are many nations that fall under the umbrella term indigenous. As a colonial tactic, it has been to divide and conquer by creating divisions between indigenous nations. For the Inuit Art Center to be successful by any measure, the WAG will have to have strong input from all of these communities. As a foundational step, the WAG has created an Indigenous Advisory Circle, which I am co-chair along with my Anuk colleague and Inuit collaborator, Dr. Heather Agluliarte. Heather will actually lead the first exhibition in this new space. This will be the first time an Inuit curator will curate this collection within the walls of the Winnipeg Art Gallery and work with the world's largest collection of Inuit art. The advisory circle is made up of representatives from four different regions of Inuit Nunatsgut, as well as urban Inuit alongside First Nations and Métis representatives from Manitoba, and we have two national Indigenous members in the arts. In, the Inuit Art Center will draw on Indigenous methodologies of collaboration, bringing together layers of knowledge from Inuit, First Nations, and the Métis Advisory, from community members, and a curatorial team in order to put forward new methodologies and disseminations of strategies. It will build on the work Jamie Isaac and I are already engaged in. Indigenizing the galley through a more nuanced curatorial approaches grounded in cultural knowledge, environment, sovereignty, social and political issues, intergenerational relations, and land-based knowledge. It will be crucial that we move forward and that there is equally strong effort to increase the WEG's collection of First Nation and Métis art, which this is a project that Jamie's already begun to work on. We want to engage Indigenous art in all areas of the gallery, and one of the biggest uh, feedback from the advisory circle is to welcome Inuit artists into the community members into our territory. This is, this is a tangible opportunity to work together as we have always historically done as Indigenous people. If there is dialogue, exchange, and communication, we will create a space that is welcoming, inspiring, and educational. The most important perspective in the building of the Inuit Art Center and its larger change to the WAG is to center Indigenous as the heart of Indigenous contemporary art and showcase the importance of investing in this future. I feel that my work as a researcher, scholar, and artist is to reveal the ontology of land, which contains memory, knowledge, and living histories. I continue to build on theories of the canoe as Indigenous methodology and the experience that the canoe teaches us about the land and our relationship to it. Much of my work has focused on Indigenous stories of place to create alternative cartographies through visual narratives. I've been fortunate enough to travel to Nunavut to work in a printmaking collective in Pangerton, to Belo Horizonte, Brazil to participate in collective performances, Santiago, Chile to create new sound work in the city in a collaboration with Thema, I also had the privilege of working with Labrador Inuit um, in uh, leading them in a printmaking workshop in St. John's, Newfoundland, and composing their work in an exhibition for Inuit Blanche. I've had a residency and exhibition in Pataka Art Museum and Gallery in Wellington, New Zealand. And this is where I installed Where White Pines Lay Over the Water. This is the image that you see right now. Um, so this project was to resurrect a strong Indigenous presence in the City of Toronto, and the new work that I was focusing on while I was on the residency is to think about that Maori history and relationship to their tributaries within Wellington. 
I wanted to explore different methodologies in cartography and geography to bring forth different epistemological views. The focus of this artwork has relied on orality and embodied knowledge as part of Indigenous theory, knowledge, and praxis. The purpose of the sound and new media installation is to narrate Indigenous stories of place through an Indigenous perspective. I wanted to create an artwork that encompassed Indigenous living histories that are linked to the land, water, and people, and the area the land subject, sub, selected for this project was the Humber River Valley. And the installation attempted to challenge linear or factual settler accounts of the history by collecting voices of historians, archaeologists, elders, various tasks looking at the land, maps, archival documents, and testimonies. One of the important aspects of the project was using a circular, non-linear approach instead of a linear time-based model. This has allowed me to construct a sound project that narrates multiple stories, perspectives, without relying on a linear time frame. And it also allows me to layer different histories of different voices. So as we know with history, is there's always competing versions of what's fact and what's not, what's fiction, what happened, what didn't happen. And the Humber River Valley had so many layers of history. And at certain moments of time that, you know, that uh, Etienne Brule had actually gone through the river, and then other people who looked at the the archival document said, well, there's no way that he could have been there because he was actually in Detroit at that time. So there's all these different kinds of um, examples of where, and we see this even within our own history here in Winnipeg. Um, so I've created both a public installation work where white pines lay over the water, and there's also a web-based work where sound and images are downloadable on a handheld device, and it can take you on an indigenous walking tour of the Humber River Valley. The intention of this work was to grapple with the body, memory, and indigenous knowledge within large urban city spaces such as Toronto. It investigates which bodies are seen, heard, and present in a competing colonial landscape such as Canada. There's a particular ability to view the landscape, allowing the one to see the layers of knowledge buried in the land and to hear the environment which sings a song of transformation of time, space, and memory. The land has the ability to retain memories of significant value that have bore witness spanning a millennia to the individual events and occurrences that have shaped our surroundings as Indigenous people. I've had the privilege and uh, the ability to work on large-scale public exhibitions such as Landslide, Possible Futures in the city of Markham, where over 30 national and international artists took over the Markham Museum. This museum was a settler museum. It had about um, 80 different pieces uh, that you could engage with. It had outdoor, um, full outdoor buildings, uh, a library, a blacksmith shop, a wagon shed, and the wagon shed is what I decided to um, engage in. The piece was called Singing Our Bones Home. It's a homage to the buried bodies that were moved from the Markham Ossuary in Ontario. So simultaneously, this work reflects on the constant relocation of Indigenous bodies that are moved, replaced, or stolen in various colonial geographies. The installation uses sound, projection, and sculpture to create a dialogue between the different architectural structures. The wigwam, which represents nomadic lifestyles, and the wagon shed that is a symbol of settlement. In this installation, the projections convey static or monochromatic landscapes that appear to be dismal or uninhibited, with ghostly figures moving through the sky. The, wib the wigwam was constructed of natural material, willing sa willow saplings, and covered with projection fabric to produce a light bucket effect. The ground was covered entirely with cedar branches, and when the viewer moved through the structure, their body would trigger the sound. So your body would determine the sound composition, so it was never the same. So the activation of these 360 binaural recordings consisted of outdoor ambient noises and sounds um, and four different honor songs in Haudenosaunee, Cree, Anishinaabe Moan, and French Michif. These songs are to honor the bodies that begin to sing these bodies back home to the spirit world or at least give them some form of peace. The installation attempted to narrate stories located in indigenous archeological sites that lie beneath the city. These buried bones and artifacts mark the history of the land and record the human relationship to the vast landscape that are established in indigenous deep time stories. Indigenous people recognize the power of particular spaces, artifacts, and bones because these items witness and embody much of the indigenous knowledge of the land. 
This installation attempt to convey this powerful relationship between the spirit world and the human realm and also recognize that um, objects and in, in particular bodies are living uh, entities. I created a new work that builds on this existing work uh, for Nuit Blanche this fall in Toronto uh, entitled Manitobois, Speaking to the Moon. This work was installed in the Bank of Montreal First People's Place. It had 27 foot ceilings and it was covered all in white marble. <laughs> so it was a little bit intimidating to say the least. Uh, I built three wigwam structures that were 16 feet diameter and about 16 feet in height. Each structure was projected inside to give kind of a light box effect with the shadows of the willow branches. So each dome held each dome interior held 360 projections in the landscape of Manitoba, and I was really interested in exploring the essence of water and also to the um, exploration where the sky world meets the land. I also was at the same time working on a new commission work for the Smithsonian in New York. The work is called Our Future is in the Land if We Listen to It. This is an immersive installation um, that both has sounds and visuals. Uh, I'm interested in exploring the landscapes that appear to be telling the viewer a story visually and through sound. Our environment is constantly shifting with examples of unclean drinking water, rapid melting of the polar ice caps, chemical contaminated lakes. Our environment is rife with examples of the finite nature of water and the catastrophe we are facing and these issues affect our society as a whole and in particular indigenous communities that are greatly influenced by changing climate and polluted water tables. I'm interested in this complex relationship with our past and how it will affect our future. Our survival and continuation as a people is tied to indigenous knowledge of the land and an extension of these land-based practices is what will bring us to the future. So in this project, I've collected um, different uh, stories and uh, voices from knowledge keepers. The work is actually really quite large. Um, it's about 16 feet in length on either wall, and it's about eight feet in height. You will also be standing uh, as the sort of images and lights and animals kind of move through the space. You'll be hearing um, voices of two knowledge keepers who spoke about the importance of how the land um, has all of this knowledge and history, what certain barks can uh, do for, for ailments and life. So this whole idea that you know we're always wondering where we're gonna go and how we're gonna deal with the catastrophe that's facing us with climate change, when in essence we have many of those answers and lots of things that we could explore through indigenous uh, knowledge, land-based knowledge. Another commission work which you see on the image is a public artwork for downtown Winnipeg at the Air Canada Park. Um, I was interested in exploring uh, Manitoba's uh, history and relationship with some of the strongest and largest hydroelectric developments in North America. I wanted to create an artwork that exposes indigenous living histories that are linked to land, water, and people. This sculptural installation is called Electrical Currents. It will focus on the relationship to hydroelectric development the communities that are affected by damming and will also reflect on all of us as participants who constantly use um, electricity on a regular basis as we you know get worried that our iPhones or handhelds you know don't hold any energy and so in fact uh, you know we greatly contribute to that so I'm really interested in kind of exploring that relationship as somebody who lived in the north for a short period of time but also thinking about how we take that kind of um, technology for granted. Um, I'm also leading a five-year project which will develop indigenous knowledge of digital and new media laboratory productions. So drawing on the power of arts to shape public spaces, create sustainable communities, providing skills and training, the project will ultimately position indigenous artists on the national stage and create new dialogues within Canada. Um, we're interested in developing a new methodology of curation and coordination of public art exhibitions, drawing on open source digital media to design labs in urban indigenous communities. So our GLAM collective will be using three public sites as case studies. Um, so we're interested in doing a contemporary public exhibition, symposium, and a lab residency in Winnipeg with the help of the Winnipeg Art Gallery and Video Pool. We'll also be doing a residency and exhibition in Halifax, Nova Scotia at Anne Ledowitz Art Gallery and the lab residency at the Media Arts and Electronics Lab at NASCAD. 
and in Montreal, center fee the lab residency at Concordia's Hexagram. Through our activities across the country, we'll foster Indigenous scholarship and contemporary Indigenous art and curatorial practices in public and community engagement. Our GLAM Collective is also working towards taking over Nui Blanche this fall in Winnipeg, and sounds like maybe Toronto next year. We'll also uh, take over Montreal, uh, Nui Blanche event, and the Nocturnal and Lights Festival in Halifax. So, um, Jurita had mentioned that we're also, or I'm also working on building a team of people to bring forth this kind of knowledge in Winnipeg. And um, we're working as a team to install or build a large scale um, mobile app, which some of these people include Dr. Sherry Farrell Reset, Dr. Sharina Kashevsky, Dr. Dr. Maureen Matthews, Dr. Frank Elbow, Dr. Negon Sinclair, and architect David Thomas. The Winnipeg App Project will be a collection of voices and knowledge of the community members, historians, archivists, archaeologists, art, architecture historians, material culture, elders, various texts. Uh, we're interested in collecting and compiling information on key people, families, communities, material culture, uh, contemporary and public artwork, and have Winnipeggers learn and participate in their own city's Indigenous history. We're also uh, working on a, uh, with the Forks Corporation to develop their South Point, um, where we're looking at um, an interactive walk that encompasses the treaties, reconciliation, and concepts of collaboration. I'm working with Dr. Negon Sinclair, and we have three local Indigenous artists on the project, which is Casey Adams, Jamie Isaac, and Val Vlint. We're excited to transform that space and that architectural team that we're, that we're excited to see what's gonna happen with that. As many of you might already know, Jamie and I have co-curated the largest Indigenous contemporary exhibition at the Winnipeg Art Gallery, and uh, really the largest contemporary exhibition in its history. Uh, it will be the first of many that we're going to do as Indigenous large-scale exhibitions. Uh, we have taken over 17,000 square feet. We have 29 artists and 12 commissions. Insurgence Resurgence builds on past large-scale Indigenous contemporary arts exhibitions since 1992, and I think it's really important to honour all of the footprints that have come before us to build this moment of transformation. We were excited and ecstatic to work with 29 artists, and each artwork assert, asserts its own cultural authority and exercises the right to refuse colonialism. Each person that worked on or with the exhibition has greatly impacted Winnipeg and beyond. It is our hope to continue this large-scale presence within the gallery and also throughout the city. The artists have created artworks that explore themes of activism, renewal, refusal, resistance, and survival in cultural, social, and political contexts. These are political, spiritual, and cultural actions towards honoring an ancestral continuance and meaningful connection to land and land-based practices within the art and social and political sphere. Acknowledging and restoring the relationship with the land as well as all our nations and relations is paramount for the insurgents resurgence movement. This November, I hope you will come out and join us. We are hosting the Initiative for Indigenous Futures, which is the first public uh, symposium. And I think the kind of catch title is, uh, the future is indigenous. Um, we will be showcasing a critical mass of artists, community, activists, curators, academics, presenting their vision of the future of indigenous people. So the first event starts uh, November 28th and we finish uh, December 2nd. We have um, multidisciplinary conversations about Indigenous art, media, and scholarship, and cultur cultural innovation. We'll be featuring Indigenous-made video games, maker spaces, new VR work, and an exhibition on film and new media. And at the same time, we're going to be hosting the First Nations Curators Exchange with Australia, New Zealand, Aratoa, and Norway. Uh, we'll also have a cultural night, which Tara will be performing at, and many others. We'll have drumming and singing and dancing on November 30th, so please come. Um, and as my time is coming to a close, I contemplate the questions of the discussion, my scholarship, artistic practice, and the overall theme of collaboration and indigenizing the space. 
I can only grapple with my own relationship with the institutions that I work in. I think it is challenging for Indigenous faculty and artists in large institutions. And what I mean by this, there is and can be a disconnect for Indigenous epistemologies and methodologies that do not conform to Western frameworks of universities. This is a constant struggle for Indigenous faculty. Not only do we have to educate many of our colleagues and staff, but in my experience, there's also a constant tension with the overall institution itself. We are fraught with the history of education and institutions that continue to govern our bodies and minds. This is profoundly problematic and cannot be easily resolved. Such radical progressive changes are only possible in institutions when they remain steadfastly determined to transform themselves beyond their current colonial structures. I've had the fortune of working with committed leaders at both the WAG and here at the U of W and also at OCAD University. I remain, however, acutely aware that this commitment can quickly shift given key individuals of upper management departures, leaving room for institutional attitudes to change. It is therefore imperative that we as Indigenous scholars, administrators, cura curators, stabilize our current precarious positions within universities and art organizations. Its essential and timely aspect involves training and mentoring the next generation of Indigenous cultural producers and thinkers to empower ourselves, our communities, and family with youth, with knowledge and opportunities that education and art can provide. I know from personal experience that art can radically shift mainstream settler ideologies and create a space for transformative social change. When I reflect on my past relationship with the Indigenous Visual Culture Program at OCAD, which is the first of its kind in Canada, now the University of Winnipeg leading the way on the Indigenous course requirement and the Winnipeg Art Gallery in our quest to find out what a new museum looks like through an Indigenous methodology, uh, in many cases, the university and the gallery are progressive institutions that want to indigenize and are determined to transform themselves into something radically different than what it was and still can be. Therefore, we as indigenous scholars are in precarious positions within the university. We are dependent on and support from upper levels of management. We are bound to the legacy of residential schools and at the same time as scholars and artists who want to empower ourselves, our communities and families and youth, we know from personal experience that education can open doors that you didn't even know existed. And the very questions that I contemplate here today are so complex that I'm not sure that I can provide an adequate response. So my last words will be from indigenous two-spirited writer and poet Beth Brandt as she beautifully articulates. Memory is like the drum. One tap, and the sound resonates and reverberates into our very soul. One poem, one story, one painting, and our hearts and bodies respond to the message. We are here, and we remember. Jimmy Gwitch. <laughs>